Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Carly P. Riley Show. The Independent Examiner report on the FTX bankruptcy is out. It is out. It is out earlier than we were actually expecting it. And the headlines are what I would expect the headlines to be. The, the main sentiment is essentially this. This is a headline that comes from the Financial Times. Probe, that is the independent examiner probe into the FTX bankruptcy, finds no error in hiring Sullivan and Cromwell for FTX bankruptcy. If you are longtime viewers of this show, you will be probably unsurprised to hear me say that I think this headline is not wrong, but I think it is a bit misleading. And I want to dive into some of the specifics here, what I think is really important and should be taken away from this examiner report. And the areas that I think, uh, or the area that I actually think is the most important from this examiner report that I did not really see getting much, and frank, frankly, I didn't see it getting any coverage in uh, in any of the articles that I was reading. So let me back up here in case you have missed some of this story. R really briefly, I've been covering the FTX bankruptcy because there is a lot that is atypical about this bankruptcy. I am uh, very interested in why this bankruptcy is atypical. I would love if we could get a great explanation uh, around the atypicalness that we have seen, to use the word atypical 6,000 times in a row. Um, and er, there was an independent examiner who was eventually appointed to look into certain facets of this case, of the FTX case, of the bankruptcy. Now, this independent examiner was initially not appointed. Uh, and then there was a whole process to even get an examiner appointed. The, the FTX debtors, the folks running the bankruptcy, objected to having an independent examiner look at this situation. Ultimately, that was appealed. Whatever, it doesn't matter. We, we finally got an independent examiner. But I say all this to say, we got an independent examiner to come in over a year after the commencement of this bankruptcy, which is not ideal if you're concerned about the way things have been run. But it is what it is. I'm glad that somebody has looked into this. Now, the second piece of context I want to give here before we dive in is that this, the examiner had a specific scope of things they were supposed to look at. And there were three main categories of things that this examiner was tasked with investigating. And the examiner said in this 230 plus page document, very long document, the examiner said, uh, you know, they really wanted to keep things to their scope. Uh, their scope was to look into whether or not there was conflicts of interest with Sullivan and Cromwell staying on as the attorneys in this bankruptcy. This is something I care about. I believe there was a conflict of interest. There is a conflict of interest with Sullivan and Cromwell running this bankruptcy, given the fact that they were a law firm that represented FTX US and in fact, Sam personally in some cases prior to the bankruptcy. So the examiner was tasked with looking into that. The examiner was uh, tasked with looking into the use and like manipulation of FTT, which is a particular cryptocurrency that FTX and Sam Bankman fried had essentially created and the ways in which FTT was used to prop up Alameda, the hedge fund. And I won't even go too deep into that. Folks may be familiar. They may not. That was another facet of this investigation. And then finally, uh, the independent examiner was asked to look into investigations into the current and former employees of the debtors. Anyway, th those last two, the manipulation of FTT and the employee piece really is not uh, that interesting to me. It, it would have been, I suppose, or it would be if I if the examiner found something revelatory there. But the examiner didn't find anything revelatory there. And neither of those have been areas I've been concerned about. I mean, I think FTT was manipulated and was used to prop up Alameda, but that we know that. I mean, you know, that feels like that's come out in court and been talked about and Caroline Ellison has pled guilty and like, you know, it's kind of been resolved. Okay. So the thing that I am really most interested in is this first one, this question about uh, whether or not Sullivan and Cromwell was sufficiently disinterested. That's essentially the test was disinterested enough in this whole situation to not have a conflict of interest in being retained as the attorney in this bankruptcy. Now, the examiner concluded that Judge Dorsey, the judge in this bankruptcy case, was was correct, was within their rights, did not err in allowing Sullivan and Cromwell to stay on as the attorney to manage this bankruptcy. What the examiner lays out here is that ultimately, Sullivan and Cromwell, the risk was that they had a potential conflict of interest in running this bankruptcy. And when there are situations where there's a potential conflict of interest, it's up to a judge's discretion whether or not they think it's problematic enough for the firm to be, that the firm needs to be recused altogether or, you know, like what the parameters of the situation should be. And that based on the information that Judge Dorsey had, he did not make some error in his judgment or like 
you know, do something corrupt himself, I suppose, right, in, in letting Sullivan and Cromwell continue to run this bankruptcy. Fine. Yeah, I, I don't actually have a problem with that. My problem has been that I think it turns out Sullivan and Cromwell does have areas in which they have clear conflicts of interest here in ways that Judge Dorsey did not necessarily know about or in ways that should have been handled differently once they were running the bankruptcy. And I'm going to be more specific about that here in just a moment, because I actually think in that regard, the examiner agrees. And we'll talk about that. The examiner has said that Judge Dorsey was fine in determining that based on the information they had, Sullivan and Cromwell can stay on and run this bankruptcy. However, the examiner did say that there are some areas for further investigation that he would like to undertake. The first area that he feels he needs to investigate further is that there is a uh, an accusation that Sullivan and Cromwell may have basically lied to the judge in terms of the work they did for Sam Bankman fried personally. That Sullivan and Cromwell said they did some amount of work for Sam Bankman fried personally when it came to him purchasing Robin Hood shares. He bought a lot of stock, Robin Hood stock, and Sullivan and Cromwell did a little bit of work advising him on that, according to them. But that there are accusations that potentially Sullivan and Cromwell actually did a lot more work and were much more involved in structuring the transactions in which Sam Bankman fried bought Robin Hood shares than they have previously disclosed. Uh, I actually had not even heard about this. I didn't know this was a rumor, an accusation, anything. Um, but I, I'm interested to hear about it now, I suppose. And so this is an area where the examiner says, I, I would like to investigate this further to find out if there's any truth to these accusations, because that would be a problem if there were truth to it. Great. Okay. I have truly no idea. I have no idea on this one. I have no information. So great. In examiner will go look into that. The second piece is that the examiner chastised Sullivan and Cromwell specifically because Sullivan and Cromwell failed to recuse themselves, failed to step aside in a part of this bankruptcy where they clearly had a conflict of interest. So what the examiner said is, look, it was fine that Sullivan and Cromwell was retained, was kept on to run this bankruptcy based on the information that we have, the information that Judge Dorsey knows. It's okay. Yes, they did work for FTX US prior, but the, the work they did prior isn't really in conflict with them running this thing. However, all of this, them continuing to run things, was predicated on the idea that when and if work they were doing for this bankruptcy did come into direct contract, uh, contact and was like directly conflicted with work they did do for FTX US prior to the bankruptcy, then Sullivan and Cromwell was supposed to step aside and recuse themselves from that part of the bankruptcy work to let another law firm handle it. And there was even already another law firm identified, Quinn Emanuel had already been identified as the conflict of interest firm who would step in if Sullivan and Cromwell had conflicts of interest here. And the examiner said specifically when it comes to this company Ledger X, which I've talked about only before, this company Ledger X, when it came to the work that needed to be done with Ledger X in this bankruptcy, it was a clear obvious conflict of interest with work that Sullivan and Cromwell had done previously with Ledger X, and they should not have been involved, and they should have stepped aside, and they should have recused themselves, and Quinn Emanuel should have handled that, and they didn't. Now, this is important to me, more important than you know the general kind of press or public, I think, would ever think about or realize, because to the extent that people think there is potentially a cover-up here, that potential cover-up by Sullivan and Cromwell is essentially that as part of Sullivan and Cromwell's work, working with LedgerX, which was a subsidiary of FTX, they made representations to the CFTC, the regulatory body, the CFTC, Sullivan and Cromwell made representations to the CFTC on behalf of LedgerX and FTX that were untrue. And the concern here is that Sullivan and Cromwell actually knew that the representations they were making to the CFTC were untrue, for reasons I'll talk about just briefly here, and that Therefore, when FTX was collapsing, they realized we have lied to the CFTC. There's potentially, I truly don't know if this is the case, but there's potentially proof that we lied to the CFTC. And we now need to manage this process, get things on lock, specifically when it comes to Ledger X, to cover up this fact. So the fact that you have the examiner in this case saying, you know, the one, you know, the real slap on the wrist I want to give, the one kind of a, the real anomalous thing that I want to talk about here in terms of just specifically what I've seen in the narrow scope that I have investigated is the fact that Sullivan and Cromwell, you know, really should have stepped aside when it came to anything with Ledger X, but they didn't. They didn't pass it on to Quinn Emanuel. That is somewhat significant to me. Now, I don't want to overstate anything here, but just to spell out 
the the theory or the concern here. It is that there was a whistleblower within Ledger X. This is actually something that comes up in the in, in the examiner's report. The whistleblower at Ledger X is referred to as whistleblower number five in the examiner's report. Because by the way, there were seven whistleblowers, six whistleblowers apparently uh, within FTX who received payments, according to this, of $25 million. $25 million was paid out to FTX whistleblowers over the course of the exchange's life cycle. Now, there's actually nuances to that. It doesn't seem like that's exactly how things played out. It wasn't a clear cut, just like $25 million of fresh cash was paid out to people. Uh, but regardless, that is in and of itself very interesting and kind of wild and something I might dive into in another episode. Regardless, whistleblower number five was somebody who was identified as being an, an employee of Ledger X who raised concerns about a backdoor that existed between Alameda and FTX and that therefore some misrepresentations were being made to the CFTC. Like all of these things occurred within whistleblower number five. And Ryan Miller, who was general counsel for FTX US and a former Sullivan and Cromwell partner, was identified within this examiner's report as being one of the people who managed and handled whistleblower five's case and the resolution of whistleblower number five's complaint. Okay. Now, Ryan Miller is the the, the general counsel for FTX US. He is a former partner of Sullivan and Cromwell. He has come from Sullivan and Cromwell directly to FTX, seemingly remained close and a close confidant uh, to Sullivan and Cromwell attorneys, his former colleagues and bosses. And Sullivan and Cromwell were the attorneys making representations on behalf of Ledger X to the CFTC. So my feeling and things I've said in the past is it seems incredibly possible to me that Ryan Miller, who was dealing with a whistleblower who raised this issue of like, hey, we are making basically false representations to the CFTC, that Ryan Miller, former partner of Sullivan Cromwell, would mention that to Sullivan and Cromwell, his old law firm, who is making these representations to the CFTC. It feels very possible that that occurred. That has been the heart of the argument for why Sullivan and Cromwell likely or possibly, I should say, knew about what was going on at FTX, knew about some of the things, whether they realized the scope of that problem, like they, it's possible they didn't even really realize how, how problematic this backdoor for Al- having, Alameda having this backdoor to FTX was. It doesn't matter though, right? Like if they knew about it and they knew that the, they, they were therefore making somewhat false representations, false representations of the CFTC, like that would make them on some level complicit, or I should say guilty of lying to the CFTC intentionally. I am a YouTube slash podcaster who can sit here and point this set of facts out and point out this set of possibilities. And I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist or like spin some tall tale. I think this is a reasonable thing to think that is different than an independent examiner. The independent examiner is, uh, I assume, not going to conjecture or speculate like that. The other piece of this that I think is, is complicated that comes out in this in this examiner's report is that Sullivan and Cromwell and seemingly other law firms used signal messages in their communication with FTX that auto-deleted. Now, this is, I mean, (laughs) if folks have been following this case, this is ironic because, you know, there was a lot made at the trial of Sam Bankman fried about the fact that there were auto-delete signal messages set up at FTX. And to have the law firms doing this as well, it just feels rich. It feels very rich. So this is all to say, like, if there is something to all of this, if it is, if the If Sullivan and Cromwell did know that there was this backdoor between Alameda and FTX, and they nevertheless said that there wasn't any such thing to the CFTC, you know, it's entirely possible we'll we'll never know and we'll never have the proof because it exists in signal messages that are have been auto deleted, right? And and by the way, I'm saying Sullivan and Cromwell, and that has been my focus, but this report, and this is ironic perhaps for reasons, but this report actually seems to suggest that Fenwick and West, which was also a major law firm that represented FTX US, that they may have known even more than Sullivan and Cromwell did certainly, or they may have known things uh, and they may have been complicit in some capacity in all of this. And that an examination into whether or Fenwick, into whether or not Fenwick or West knew things or didn't know things is still ongoing. That's sort of still an open question that is left open in this examiner's report. So perhaps that's where the attention should be. I say it's ironic only because <laughs> Sullivan and Cromwell is running this bankruptcy. Fenwick and West is their competitor. Uh, Sullivan and Cromwell is, is kind of the, the puppet master here. It's you know maybe not surprising that their competitor is somehow coming out of this examiner report with unresolved questions in a way that Sullivan and Cromwell maybe is, is less so. But also auditing firms are called out in this report as not having done their jobs properly at all when it came to FTX US. So there's clearly a cadre of 
institutions that bear potentially some level of responsibility in all of this. But to wrap it up, <clears throat> I will say this. I will, I'll, give you my, I'll give you some optimism and give you some pessimism depending on where you land on this and, and what you think about everything. For me, what I want is to get to the truth. That sounds lame. It sounds corny, but it, it's the reality. I, I think there is, again, so much that is atypical about this bankruptcy. There is so much that doesn't really make sense if you view it through the lens of just a normal bankruptcy. And I want to understand where that atypicalness comes from. Like, what is driving that? And I think one of the stronger theories is that for some reason, the debtors don't want the FTX exchange restarted. They don't want any part of it even sold to somebody who might restart it. Like they want this whole thing shut the F down. And maybe that's not true. Maybe there are very legitimate reasons for why the exchange isn't being restarted or it's it, parts of the exchange aren't being sold. But there has been very little transparency. There's been virtually no transparency into that part of this bankruptcy process, which is where you find a lot of these weird anomalous things that have just gone without any sort of explanation. And so again, one of the compelling theories would be for some reason, the debtors, somebody doesn't want this exchange restarted. They want everything kind of buried and shut down and on lock and, and done. One of the arguments for why that could be the case, if that's the case, is again, a cover up. But there's other reasons why perhaps folks want this exchange just completely shut down and dead whether or not that's what's best for creditors. And so anyways, as part of that, one of the things that is strange is just how non-transparent all of these sale processes in this bankruptcy have been. And I think it's possible that the examiner is interested in looking into some of this as well. This is not within the scope of this examiner. This examiner was not asked at all to look at how this bankruptcy has been run. Right. And that is for me, one of the things I'm most interested in is why and how has this bankruptcy been run the way it has been? The examiner was not at task with looking at that. Right. That wasn't part of their mandate. But they did have a line in here that I thought was very interesting that no, I haven't seen any press outlets really making much of. But to me, it was the most interesting part of this entire thing. The examiner chastised Sullivan and Cromwell. They said, you should have recused yourself from the Ledger X portion of this whole thing. You didn't. But okay, but I still think there are some elements to this Ledger X thing that uh, warrant further investigation. So I recommend I do the investigating. Most of what he's recommending he investigates is about like whether or not there's more money to be reclaimed from the original sale of Ledger X. I won't even get into that so much. I don't think it matters. But there's this one line that the examiner threw in on the back end of all of this that I thought was really interesting. They said, in doing that work where I kind of look and see, oh, should, you know, is there more money to be reclaimed because of, you know, whatever. Is there an avoidance action that can be brought based on the original sale of Ledger X or the original acquisition of, of Ledger X by FTX, whatever. They, he then says, this investigation may also provide additional insight into how the Ledger X transactions unfolded. And that was the line that was most interesting to me because that is something that I, I would like to understand more. I would like to understand more how the Ledger X sale during the bankruptcy unfolded because it it strikes me as strange, strikes me as very opaque. And throughout this whole process, there have been sale processes or a lack of sale processes that have felt very opaque and very confusing. And this then to me is the crack in the door to potentially getting some of the answers I want. Now, like I said earlier, I'm not overly hopeful because I think that the answers may lie in signal messages that have been deleted. I don't know. <laughs> but I am at least glad to see that the examiner is maybe hinting at wanting to learn more about how these transactions have transpired. Though again, it's sort of out of their scope, but I'm hoping that in adding this language in here, this is the examiner's way of, of somewhat in the the go ahead they're going to get for some of these future examinations, like they're trying to bring it a little bit more in scope. There's other things, there's other questions that have been raised by, you know, there was a paper by two law professors, Lipson, Jonathan Lipson, and David Skeel that raised questions around why hasn't that why haven't the debtors sued Binance? They they seem like they would have a really good case for suing Binance. You know, I've had questions about FTX EU and why the debtors said FTX EU was, they said they were going to try and sell FTX EU. Then they said it was unable to be sold. And then they tried to buy it themselves. The, the debtors, the FTX debtors tried to buy FTX EU after having said it was completely worthless. Like that is so weird. It is so weird. And it's interesting because in the examiner report, they mention that Sullivan, that the debtors, I shouldn't say Sullivan and Cromwell, that the debtors had tried to sell FTX EU and then said it was worthless. 
But then they don't mention the part in this examiner's report about how they tried to buy it th- themselves. I don't think I don't think there's anything suspicious about that. I don't think the independent examiner is like covering for them in any way. It's just to say that there's a lot that I am interested in that I think is most atypical about this bankruptcy that is just completely out of the scope of this investigation. All right, folks, I will continue to follow along the story and bring you information that I think is important or worthwhile. And if you have been enjoying it, please do consider subscribing to the channel, liking, commenting, all the things, you know the things. And with that, I will see you next time.